Hello again. Welcome to part two uh, for week four's lecture. So we're going to now look more closely at some of the architectural feature connected to the Sanskrit cosmopolis. Because while language played a huge role in unifying cultures and enabling conversation to take place across vast, vast, vast domains, it was actually through architecture that we're able to detect some of the most concrete forms where power is made manifest. So nothing expresses power like a monumental piece of architectural statement, right? So uh, in, within the context of the Sanskrit cosmopolis, therefore, when one is to create an architectural statement, it needs to also rest on a very specific set of grammatical rules, which is another way of saying that it contains a number of unique design, uh, design principles that you're meant to conform to. So these design principles were formulated uh, into manuals, and these manuals then define what is the correct way to create a building uh, that serves specific religious function. However, it is also a manual that speaks across religious systems, offering this technology of building uh, that enables the manifestation of cosmology in our physical realm uh, to different religious practices and uh, religious sects. So the manual is called a sastra. Uh, this word survives in the Malay language to mean literature, but basically what sastras are is that they are a genre of texts that concern principally with prescriptions of how to do things in a certain way, or how to do things in a correct way. So what we're seeing here is therefore a very versatile system of building large-scale representation of the cosmos serving not just one religion. It is an architectural template and technology used to express both Hindu and Buddhist cosmology uh, in the examples that we find across Southeast Asia. So here I need to segue to give some context to the relationship between Buddhism and Hinduism. Okay, so this relationship was a variable one uh, according to Mitzik. Uh, it exists in a spectrum uh, of relationships between the two religions and they existed uh, across uh, different times and different places. Uh, and what is important to note is the importance attached to doctrinal purity also varied between different social and occupational classes that are followers of either religious practices. Uh, so typically, uh, some of the older theories concerning uh, the Hindu-Buddhist sort of uh, relationship is that there is a kind of syncretistic uh, amalgamation or hybrid of these two religions. So people essentially practice what is a Hindu-Buddhist religion. So meaning that they uh, have certain practices that are Hindu and there's, there's certain practices that are Buddhist and they mix it all together. And then there's also a competing theory that suggests they're primarily Buddhist and they are Mahayana Buddhist. Uh, but this Buddhism is heavily uh, colored by Hindu cultural practices. Recent scholarship, however, are asking us to picture a much more complex relationship at play between Hinduism and Buddhism during that period. Uh, and to think of early Hinduism and Buddhism as being flexible enough to accommodate and also, more importantly, to utilize each other's icons. So in the sense, they share the same substratum of artistic vocabulary. Uh, 
a scholar by the name of Hariani, Santip used the term parallelism to describe Hindu-Buddhist relationship in Java. So, in spite of the differences, I think both shared a common objective in religious goal, which in some ways is to achieve a comprehension of absolute reality. Uh, of course, this achievement is believed to confer supernatural and also political power to the person who is successful. Uh, so therefore, I think uh, uh, when we sort of think uh, through very specific examples, we should be able to see how this parallelism plays out. So more concretely, for example, uh, there was uh, in the Nagara Krat Kratagama, which is a well-known Javanese text, it makes clear that there were three religious bureaucracies uh, that were jealously guarding their separate identities back in Java. Then uh, they were the Saivas, or those who worshipped Shiva, uh, the Sugatas, and these are the Buddhists, as well as the Risi. And these are the forest dwellers, uh, those uh, who uh, abstain, uh, who chose to take a vow of abstinence uh, and live as simple as possible a life uh, in the forest, away from civilization. So the ruler, uh, at any point in time, might give their patronage to more than one of these competing religious institutions. Uh, so at the same time, they can also be uh, uh, revering, for example, Vishnu. Uh, uh, as, a, as a god or a deity, although there was no separate Vaishnavite clergy then. Uh, all of these then exist within a competing field, uh, fighting with each other for royal patronage, because royal patronage brings prestige, uh, it confers uh, 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 the much-needed sort of capital in order to build up your religious base and help with uh, all the missionary work that you want to undertake. So it is quite likely that an uh, individual layperson might pay homage to both Shiva or Vishnu and also to Buddha at the same time. And in that way, it can be said that it's syncretistic as a sort of practice but this does not mean they couldn't tell the difference between uh, a, a, a Shaivite uh, school versus a, a Buddhist practice. And these competing religions definitely could not ignore each other. In fact, they found it necessary to refer to one another very frequently, if only to demonstrate their own superiority through comparison. Uh, it's important that this is not done through war, even though war was plentiful, it wasn't, you don't fight over religion, uh, but you do this through art and literature. So in iconographic terms, for example, you would have a Buddhist deity, Vajrapani, stepping over Shiva, right? Uh, stepping or trampling over the body of Shiva in order to bring him back to life again as a demonstration of a Buddhist comprehension of reality is superior to uh, a Hindu one, and therefore absorbing the Hindu sort of claim to understanding reality within uh, a Buddhist uh, concept of reality that is bigger and closer to the absolute truth. Uh, but I think these kinds of like comparison do point to a lot of complexity when we think of how uh, even rulers themselves uh, frequently uh, change their patronage, uh, uh, often jumping across to another set in order to shore up their own political power and therefore using their conversion to legitimize uh, their rule within a very unstable system where they're actually competing against other claimants. Okay, Okay. going back to architecture, let's compare uh, some of the Hindu architecture uh, that we find in this part of the world versus that of India. 
to see where they converge and where they differ. So what I have on the screen are the Javanese and Tamil Nadu models for the Garba Gra. And this is the same type of building. Uh, in the north, you have the Shikara, and on the south side, uh, the, uh, the Vimana, and they contain what is called uh, the inner sanctum uh, for housing the principal deity of the temple. And uh, this is based on the Indian Sastra on building. Uh, so you, the, the Sastra would prescribe that you need to sort of like build uh, a, a religious structure in a certain way in order to house the deity and only if the, if the structure is built in this way the, it is suitable for the deity to live in. So earlier I've hinted that we might perhaps have to revise Pollock's idea of an over-determined pre-packaged idea of Sanskrit that because it is obsessed with grammar and purity it was something that was already fully developed, pre-packaged and then exported to different corners of this Sanskrit cosmopolis uh, in areas that we consider as the periphery, say like Southeast Asia. While not downplaying the grammar-centric dimensions of Sanskrit, I think scholars are also calling for a much more nuanced understanding of how these grammars are deployed. Uh, because principally, don't forget, the grammars are texts. And we forget how big a role interpretation is or play in the discrimination between what we understand or interpret as orthodox or permissible versus what is heterodox or what is erroneous or nonconformist. Therefore, in looking at you know textual record of how a building is supposed to be constructed, you need to apply interpretation and imagination to visualize uh, uh, how it would possibly look like. And therefore, this contributes to also divergences and different models uh, developed in Java uh, compared to, for example, its Indian counterpart. So when we compare these two examples, uh, the similarity is clear in the sense that they conform to the Shastric uh, prescription of the type of suitable building form that one needs to construct in order to house a god. And typically this is in the shape uh, of a roof structure that takes a pyramidal form uh, because this symbolizes uh, also the cosmic mountain and serves as the axis that connects this world and the transcendent realm. Uh, however, it is in the smaller details that we find uh, different ways in which interpretation has been applied. So pay attention, for example, to the tiered roof superstructure, where in the Javanese example, you see it being much more pronounced, uh, as if it is stacked on, rather than in that pyramidal form that uh, in the Tamil Nadu uh, that, uh, that is more visible in the Tamil Nadu counterpart. Uh, but also, when we look at the portico entrance uh, of, uh, the, uh, of these uh, towers, uh, what you find is that uh, there is a greater variety in style. So the portico entrance here, as you can see, uh, has a portico. Uh, it, it has a pediment, which is a triangular form, and it's shaded, uh, creating a slight passageway that serves, a, uh, that serves as a buffer between the inside world and the outside world. Uh, whereas uh, in the smaller structure over here, uh, you see a different kind of like lintel construction uh, that also sort of creates a, uh, a kind of like a buffering zone that uh, transits the person from the outside world into the in, in a rep, in, in a sanctum. However, I think in uh, the the Tamil Nadu example, uh, perhaps it's not very sort of clear here. This is not a prominent feature uh, in the construction of the entrance. Uh, another uh, uh, significant difference is how uh, typical of uh, Javanese. Uh, 
Chandi, uh, uh, this kind of tower construction, is that it would often be erected on a raised plane with a stairway leading up. And therefore, these are some of the little details that shows a local kind of interpretation or understanding of what is essentially textual form of transmission. Then there is also the innovation of new types of design and uh, there's something very distinct and very unique to Java is the appearance of the Kala Makara door frame uh, and also uh, uh, in some instances used as a niche uh, so these are false doors almost and using the door-like frame as a ornamental device uh, to accentuate uh, specific uh, architectural dimensions of the building. And similar, uh, and, and what is unique about the Kala Makara is that it's combining two very distinct mythological characters uh, from Hindu mythology uh, and bring them together to form a new composite. So Kala here refers to this uh, demon-like looking, uh, demonic looking uh, creature that often hovers above the doorway uh, and it is a symbol of time itself. Time is symbolized here as a figure, as a demonic figure who divorces a person who eats you up as you grow old and ultimately die, as everyone must experience this life process. Flanking the Kala figure that sits above the door are two Makaras that serve as guardians of this portal. So what you get here is a very interesting conceptual statement uh, that uses the door as your everyday normal architectural component of a building and invest in the door a very conceptual idea about the movement from one room into another as an occasion to mark also the passage of time. It's a reminder that time is running out but it is also a call to act upon the precious gift of life that we have now uh, to do good and to turn our attention towards religion. Uh, how, uh, so let's compare this for example to a different style of door frames that you, you find in Tamil Nadu uh, which is also used for Nietzsche so they share this unique feature that door frames are also uh, 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 can also be deployed uh, for ornamental purposes but here we see the construction is uh, much more straightforward. It's a geometric angular uh, uh, type of framing uh, with very thick columns and very pronounced lintel. Uh, and uh, if it was crowned by anything, it takes the shape of like a tree or a, a representation of the jewel uh, and very different from the Kala Makara uh, sculptural form that we uh, saw in the previous example. Uh, so, therefore, uh, having uh, established that perhaps there, uh, there are different ways the uh, artisans of the past have interpreted the sastras in order to develop uh, a kind of vocabulary or a language of architecture that is unique to this part of the world, uh, one of the things that we can pay attention to is how then this also allows for cross-regional transfer of knowledge and technology. And we, this can be deduced through looking closely, uh, using visual analysis to recognize how distinctive, the distinctive features that I have just spelt out before uh, such as the raised plane, uh, you know, the kind of like uh, portico construction, the tiered roof structure, uh, really uh, was something that would emerge also in the Cambodian context. We know that these were uh, built later, and therefore uh, one could postulate that there was a transference of knowledge from Java to uh, the Khmer Empire as Khmer 
gain increasing prominence uh, within Southeast Asia as the new mandala polity. Uh, and therefore, this leads us to our next slide. What is the mandala? Here, I think it's important to remember this is a Sanskrit word, and it really it translates simply as circle. Uh, when we see the mandala, it takes many different forms, but principally, uh, it can be described as a kind of diagram that represents the universe. Uh, it is characterized often by a center point and often uh, possess a radial balance. Uh, it serves a very really specific uh, religious function. So it's typically used for meditation practice to train one's imagination. Uh, it's also used as a diagrammatic system to store information and knowledge uh, so that you can remember things faster and uh, more easily. Uh, also, uh, because it has very abstract qualities to it, it can also serve the purpose of inducing trance that helps you to uh, enter a higher meditative state. Uh, so, uh, as a term itself, it really covers quite a whole range of different design diagrams, uh, ranging from the Tibetan scroll paintings and sand paintings to the kind of more abstract diagrammatic yantras or meditation diagrams uh, used in tantric practices and also arguably it can be applied to uh, 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 columns uh, which is a form of drawing from Tamil Nadu uh, created using rice flour uh, that takes a very impermanent form so typically a column would be drawn outside one's home uh, each morning uh, and this would attract ants and birds to come and partake in a meal, therefore creating a very generous kind of ecology of coexistence uh, through this act of uh, giving uh, right, to other forms of sentient being and recognizing that they exist uh, alongside oneself in, one sp in, in the same space. In this sense, therefore, I think we can think of the mandala as taking on a spatial dimension uh, sometimes this is described as an architecture and in its diagrammatic form it often resembles a f architectural floor plan uh, which gives you a sense of how or where things are distributed in space. Uh, in this way I think uh, as a floor plan we think of it as a floor plan as a way to sort of like think of one's relationship to other people as a way to sort of like map out uh, one's place in the universe uh, in a way, then mandala is a kind of technology and it is rooted or has its origin in Tantra, which is a type of mystical practice that developed or emerged in India and this was later adopted by both Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay? Uh, and therefore, when we look at the many plans of all the Hindu Buddhist monuments in Southeast Asia, what you see is that they take on features that are distinctly mandala-like in that they have a point, a center point out of which there's a radial balance that shows very symmetrical features and structures. And finally, we arrive at the Borobudo. It's not going to be a huge part of my lecture. I'm just going to quickly go through it uh, because I would like you to spend time exploring it at your own pace and also this is part of your assignment to discover the Borobudo uh, together as a group. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly sort of like go through it. Typically, when we think of the Borobudo, there are two or let's say three components. There's a hidden component uh, that depicts the realms of desire. Or uh, what is the realm of desire? Are these are sort of like activities that are associated with human desires. Uh, greed, sex, uh, trying to do good, all the things that are related to activities that takes place in this world uh, uh, is in the hidden realm. But uh, very early on, uh, after the base was built, it was decided very quickly that this was not meant to be shown and therefore it was very quickly buried and covered up and therefore never formed the main part of the Borobudo monument. Uh, 
uh, throughout its sort of like use and existence until it was uh, later on uh, abandoned and, uh, and rediscovered much later. So the hidden base itself uh, uh, is the most fun base because it includes characters like businessmen, bankers, children, animals, things that are very relatable and things that we still can connect with because they are uh, part of what makes us human. Uh, uh, above this sort of like uh, Kamadatu realm or the, pan the hidden base uh, is where typically, if in the past, is the main sort of like uh, uh, entrance. This is the thing that you will see when you enter the Borobudo. And this is the realm of form or the Rupa Datu. And there is a lot of uh, relief panels here. Uh, showing different Buddhist stories related to the lives of the Buddha uh, before he became the Buddha. So the walkway itself surrounds the entire monument and it's decorated by more than 2,600 relief panels carved in stone itself. It's also a very amazing visual resource if you want to get a sense of what Java was like in 900 Common Era uh, because not a lot of other visual evidences survive to give you a picture of what this world was like. Uh, and the Rupa Datu uh, 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 part of the, the Borobudur is basically an area that is meant to sort of inculcate and teach you about uh, the process in which Buddha learns about his true nature and therefore achieves enlightenment. And in following this process, you're also invited on a journey. Uh, and this journey then structures uh, around the Borobudur, where as part of uh, how you would ex supposed to experience uh, the monument is that you will undertake what is called a circumambulation, which is the ritual act of walking clockwise around the monument and then ascending to the next terrace and then once you completed the, the clockwise around and you ascend to another level again until you reach the highest point okay when you reach the highest point you also reach the realm of formlessness or the arupa datu and this is a, 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 an area that is devoid of any car relief panels depicting stories. Here instead, there are circular forms in a cone-shaped forms uh, where you see perforated stupas. And these cone-shaped forms are called stupas. And they have perforations, meaning they have like uh, punctuated holes. Uh, and when you look through those holes, you see the Buddha statues resting inside. Uh, okay? Uh, so, uh, and these stupas, and therefore uh, hiding what is essentially a uh, uh, figurative form itself, therefore makes the entire landscape a lot more abstract. It becomes majestic. It's also sort of marking this area from the previous area where we're still concerned primarily with details, with features, with figure. And it's part of this sort of uh, uh, Buddhist idea of how form itself is really connected to our attachment with the physical world. Whereas as we ascend uh, into a higher state of mind, uh, things then become more abstract, right? Uh, an abstraction uh, and enlightenment and, uh, you know, the perfection, the completion of oneself in the realm of enlightenment cannot be represented or fully represented by the figure, okay? Uh, because it is so much bigger than that. Uh, so, uh, with the Borobudur, it's a monument that was commissioned by the Silendra dynasty, uh, and they were a ruling family of the Talesocracy, that uh, included both the Medang Kingdom and Sri Vijaya on some level. So the history is not sort of like always very clear and there are always new sort of findings that are providing different ways to interpret uh, who the Silendras really are. But they were the ones that commissioned the building of the Borobudur. 
Uh, but it was never called the Borobudur originally. In fact, uh, uh, the, the name itself really came from a compound term, uh, you know, uh, found in two inscriptions dated 1824 and 1842. Uh, so the word Borobudur is a folk name uh, that came out of the compound term Bumi Sambara Buddhara. And this is often refers to the mountain of combined virtues of the 10 stages of Bodhisattva hood. Uh, it's really not that uh, a, a term that was used to uh, describe Borobudur in the past, uh, but uh, uh, other scholars have instead proposed that perhaps uh, a more accurate term would be uh, something like Kamulan. Uh, indicating the original center of the kingdom. And from the word itself, uh, you can tell that Kamulan is an affix that is derived from the word mula. So like in the Malay language, in the Javanese language itself, Austronesian in general, you have affixes that then transforms the very root word uh, to, uh, to, to, to take on a new meaning. And therefore, Kamula is, Kamulan is really Kamulaan. Uh, referring in, uh, to actually the point of origin of beginning. Uh, so what is this point of origin of beginning? Uh, if you've done your reading this week, you would have gotten a sense that this point of beginning is some kind of ancestral linkage and connection. Uh, therefore, uh, as much as the layout and the grand design is Hindu-Buddhist and Sastric conforming, there is also another dimension that is turning inwards and recognizing uh, the genealogical axis is also connected to something that has existed before uh, uh, the importation or the use of Sanskrit as a language and vehicle for political power. Uh, and this takes the form of the Pundan, right? Uh, and the indigenous Pundan often appears uh, as a terrace mound. Uh, typically, this is found in central Javanese, or, and there are also southern uh, Sumatran examples. Uh, and uh, they are sites where one connects with one's ancestors. And therefore, if we were to look at uh, the Borobudur from this perspective, what is unique and interesting is how the Borobudur now can be re read and recognized as a stupa that integrated with both the indigenous Pundan concept of the terrace with the mandala form itself. Uh, and this is a testimony to a kind of local design principle. This principle is centered on the idea of the composite. And the composite has the power to bring things together uh, test out new relations, reconfigure that relationship, and produce something new uh, in the process.